Today, I want to talk about three heretical ideas. Uh, the first is that all data that you're storing is actually time series data. Uh, time series actually initially started as somewhat a niche market. It might have been tick data from financial instruments. It moved, what many of you are probably familiar with, into DevOps data or monitoring data, where you're collecting metrics from your deployed servers and APM monitoring. Uh, but now it's actually everywhere. We see it as regular streams of sensor data from machines and, and devices. We see it as irregular events from webs and machines and humans. We see forward-looking time series for logistics and forecasting, or it's even derived. It is inferences from complex machine learning algorithms. But the point is that, in fact, one of the reasons that time series data is everywhere is one way to think about it is time series data is actually just recording the change of your data. And you're all doing it. In fact, the write-ahead log in your database has been doing this for decades already. The second is that now that all time series data, uh, now that all data is time series, but what you've heard actually about time series data is wrong. So one thing you've been heard is that time series has a very specific format. It's a name with a bunch of tags and data that looks like a timestamp and a value. And you might think this is your first time series, and sometimes people ask, how many time series do you have? What they mean is, if you, let's say, want to associate it with that same device, CPU and free memory, you call this your second time series. And we'd argue that this is actually wrong. The reason it's wrong is because it's saying whatever data model you have, you actually need to map into a very specific storage model. That's this narrow table format. And arguably, we, we say that actually a lot of time series data has a richer structure, and we should be able to leverage that in a narrow model, in a wide model, in a schemaless model when it's possible. And once you have that, you can do a lot of interesting things. You could, for example, make fewer queries because you're actually accessing a wide format. You could do complex filters on your data. You can do complex aggregations across your data. You might ask correlations between these two datas, where if you, norm if you separated them, you actually lost this correlation. And you might actually, next to your time series data, you often have business data or metadata, and you want to actually join between these two things to ask, again, richer questions. And so we'd argue that actually time series data has an inherently relational structure. Somebody was also already talking about IBM right before me, and in fact, IBM had a great solution for this back in the 1960s. Our data is relational. We argue, in fact, you should use SQL as a lingua franca of your data analysis. Why SQL? Simple uh, queries are actually simple. It's a very powerful language. Complex queries are powerful. And in fact, you could easily join across all the data between your time series data and your business and metadata. In fact, you already know how to use it today. Your analysts can query it. They could write. Uh, they could use their BI tools, they could write SQL, your programmers develop on it, and your legacy C++ application from 10 years ago actually could already work against it. Uh, and by doing so, you effectively inherit this vast ecosystem from visualization to BI to ETL to ERP to serverless. All these tools actually speak SQL today, and if your database speaks SQL, you could use them out of the box. And so we like to think of this third metric of scalability, that actually by using scale, uh, SQL, you scale across your organization, because you give this one data set and then unlock it across both your engineering team, your analysts team, your customer service team, your, your business team, and so forth. One thing I want to point out, SQLish is not SQL. SQLish adds mental friction. You need to retrain your org. You can't do what you want. You lose functionality. Your existing tools break, and so you lose the ecosystem. So today we work on, I'm from TimescaleDB, we provide an open source time series database. It's actually purpose built on Postgres and supports full SQL. And the last question you have is, does it actually scale? It's a relation, it built on a relational database. I'll leave you with a few data points. One, compared to Postgres, the ones were built, 20x higher inserts and a bunch of query optimizations up to time order group buys to be 10,000 times faster. Versus your favorites, NoSQL, Mongo, again faster with uh, query optimizations like 1,500 times. Against Cassandra, 10x faster inserts, and again, thousands of times faster on some queries. In fact, just yesterday, we uh, published a blog post about comparing a, a three or five node timescale cluster versus a 30 node Cassandra cluster, and found out that we were still getting 40% faster inserts at one tenth the cost. And so why you could do this, build on top of an existing relational database, is the way we did was we purpose built it for this, recognizing that the tr traditional transactional model, the way people built relational databases to handle OTP workloads, is not the same as a t uh, time series workload. And so you could architect your data model and your storage engine differently because of this workload different. If you want to find out more, I'm happy to answer it here. Otherwise, you could check out our open source or find us on Slack. Thank you.